Hello everyone, welcome to the Desolation Sounds podcast. My name is Stephen Hook and this is a podcast celebrating everything to do within the world of alternative music, be it rock, punk, metal or extreme metal. I am going to be late for work. I should not be recording. I should be getting for work, ready for work. But it's okay. Coming on this week's show, we've got news, breaking news, breaking wholesome news, in fact, from Condra and Radiohead. And that's it. Album reviews, though, come from Ramstein, Frank Carton, Route Snakes, Omon Amarth, and the open mic for this week is Converge. But yes, we will start with the news as ever. <clears throat> Excuse me. So yeah, we'll start with Converge. Um, they are, they are, they have been signed or will release their second solo album. I don't think this will apply for the collaborative album they're doing with uh, Pigeon. Um, but they've announced that their next album will, re- will be released on Nuclear Blast Records for the US and the rest of the world, as well as Holy Raw for over here in Blighty and the EU. In a tweet, they say working with uh, Monte Carna and the Nuclear Blast team is a real privilege and we're looking forward to bringing our next record out as soon as possible. Wholesome news. They are, I think Conjure are fucking brilliant and I think they fit the ethos of Nuclear Blast very well and with Monte Carna's name being attached to it, I think it's it was only a matter of time, I think. So well, well done to the boys. Well done, boys. I would say go out and have a pint, but it's fucking miserable weather at the moment and the other bit of news is a weird one so who is it it was came from johnny greenwood who is a name i recognize i probably should recognize but i haven't got time to go and google it uh so mr greenwood put on as member of radiohead that'll do it we got hacked last week someone stole tom's mini disc archive from around the time of ok computer and reportedly demanded one hundred and fifty thousand dollars on threat of releasing it so, instead of complaining much or ignoring it, we're releasing all 18 hours on Bandcamp in aid of Extin- Extinction Rebellion. Just for eight- the next 18 days. So, for £18, you can find out if we should have paid that ransom. Uh, never intended for public consumption, though some clips did reach a cassette on the OK Computer reissue. It's only... Oh, God. Tangentially interesting? Tangent? Yeah, sure. Uh, and very, very long. Not a phone download raining outside, isn't it, though, Johnny, from the band, that their band, Radiohead. So, if it wasn't already obvious, someone's, like, holding Radiohead up for ransom, and they've responded by releasing all the music that they've reportedly stolen um, for, public, like I said, public consumption. It is a big old file. 18 hours worth of rare Radiohead content, but... Although I've never gone in on Radiohead, I know there is a mass following behind that band. They are one of, like, no matter what music you go into, usually they are universally loved. Um, But again, more wholesome news. All the efforts on that is going to go to Extinction Rebellion, which is a a non-violent charity aiming to reduce the carbon footprint of the planet as a whole. And stop us all dying, which, depending on the day and the week, I would totally be on board with today, especially. Eh, but... Wholesome things indeed. And pretty much that was all the news. I can't find anything. I think everyone's gone on holiday. I've just stayed inside because it's raining. So with that, we'll go straight on to our reviews. And we're going to start off with Rammstein, the German juggernauts themselves, uh, with an album that has no name. It is their seventh album from the new... new Norddeutzer Harte? I got called out for my German last week by Bell at Decibels, and I'm very, very conscious of every time I try and think slightly non-English. Uh, I think everyone knows the deal with Rammstein by now. It is big, bombastic, usually quite aggressive music, and it sounds like it should sit somewhere between a porno and a snuff film. And I was excited because this is the first Rammstein album that I've been conscious of. Um, I think I must have got into Rammstein around... 2008, nine, which would have been um, around the time of Libra's Falada came out, yeah, 2009. But I didn't think I got into any of the songs from the album until much later. I think I went for, ended up going for like all the classics, you know, like um, Du Hast, Son, Firefly, America. I think America must have been the first one. Hmm. Oh, that or Pussy, because we were all children, and it's got a rude in it. Um, but yeah, so, 
after getting into Ramshan through all of them and then eventually becoming aware of Libra's father there, I was always quite intrigued to find out what the next Ramstein album would be. But from there, they have, you know, they've had a bit of a break from Ramstein. I know Richard's gone off to do Emigrate again. Till had his uh, Lindemann side project. So it's it's been a long old way, which I'll get to a bit more in a bit. But, it, like, for the album itself, it opens with the first two singles that we heard from Ramstein and the leader. We've got Deutschland and Radio. Deutschland features a really cool uh, riff trade-off between Richard and Christian on uh, guitars and synthesizer, which I think I mentioned when it for, um, when I, well, I eventually got around to it when it first came out. I like the fact that in the song, Richard was able to just show off the, like a bit of like guitar flair, which, from my knowledge of Ramshan, I don't really recall him doing all that often. Um... But the little like battle between him and Christian was really really cool to hear, and as ever, Till sounded fantastic. Um, those verses where he's relatively isolated, he just commands. Like if this was about a hundred years ago, like any other point in history, he would be commanding armies with a voice like that, and you would shit yourself if he bollocked you. You'd probably shit yourself if he bollocked you now. Let's be honest, but apparently he's quite a nice chap, and I believe that. I'll believe anything. The second song we heard was Radio. Uh, it features more of an OG feel in terms of songwriting. Think Do Hast meets Fryer Fry with like a modern commercial veil over the top of it all. Quite like Chuggy Race with that little bit of um, that electronic riff just playing over the top. Um, both complete with hugely controversial music videos to maintain the aura that they built over the years while still endearing themselves to a new generation of fans because it has been 10 whole years ah, 10 years sub like six months and as time got on and it's like rumors forever circulating about oh a new Rammstein album is going to be great you'd be forgiven if you might think that this late in their career Rammstein might try to half-ass it we talked about the 10-year gap. They've been a band for over 20 years now. They've had um, one or two side projects along the way. A lot of them happened most recently, um, or at least like became reactivated recently in the time since Libra's Falada. And members of the band have all spoken about how this might be the last album. So you might think that they just, you know... Very go through the motions just to get an album out, get a tour done, and then ride off into the German sunset. But they haven't done that at all. Ramstein have remained like they are still the consistent juggernaut of talent that we that we just come to love. After those two openers to familiarize the listener, we get straight into uh, Zeig dich. Sure, track three. Um, it is a wonderful like symphonic industrial crossover metal thing um think like a more brutal version of mine hurts brent from whatever album that came off i can't remember off the top of my head and from there goes into auslander easily my favorite song on the album it is so good excuse me everything from like the chorus trade-off between till and that little electronic vo vocal Tills, um, the way he delivers lines in in the verse, well, just all over, but particularly in the, the first verse when he goes, international, it's just, oh, it gets me. It always does. The song itself sounds like it should be, like, in a cave, like, under the pretense of some colourful, duff-duff, drug-ravished rave. It is the most 90s thing anything sounded, and I've had to, like, past two or three weeks of listening to something that's grunge or new metal. It's fucking incredible. I love Auslander as a song. Um, from top to bottom, this album is unmistakably Rammstein, which there's no like dramatic experimentation. There's no ode to outside project. You're not listening to a song and thinking, this sounds very much like Lindemann or this sounds like Emigrate or whatever. And it doesn't need to be. It's so self-indulgent. And at this point in their career, they're allowed to be. They can totally do 
they can just be Ramshine and we know guaranteed it's at least going to be a 7 or 8 out of 10. The only time I really found myself having to stop and like really like, this is definitely a Ramstein, isn't it? Um, was on the song Pop. And that's because I think by now we're all very aware of Till's vocal range. And on the entire album, he pretty much goes through it all. He's got like the big, almost operatic notes to those very low, dense, almost ASMR type thing. Um, but on Pup, for the first time that I can properly recall, and you know, let me know if I'm being, if I'm ignoring a very prominent Ramstein song, but he sounds outright depraved on Pup. That deep baritone voice of his, it just sounds evil, like it's guttural, and you know, like bloodthirsty. Just the rasp on his voice, which he's known for being like quite the clean singer anyways and just if he goes to his big notes it's usually more of like a shout sort of thing this is like a a desperate growl and it really did like first few times i listened to it i had to stop and like holy fucking shit this sounds terrifying let's listen to it again when it tries to go for um the more like serene thought sort of lots of s's when it tries to go for the more serene sort of thing um, I think Diamant wins over Vasis Liebe. Um, I think the mood it's trying to set is executed so much better on Diamant than Vasis Liebe. I think because uh, Vasis Liebe does like try to still incorporate that the Rammstein rock sound, whereas Diamant stays pretty pretty committed to that very. Um, idyllic symphonic kind of thing i think it just what it's trying to execute it does it better on diamant um and you can i had a similar thing last week with um potence and fractor although you don't understand what he's saying or that he does like jump between about five different languages on this although you don't understand what he's saying on diamant you are able to understand and feel that emotion because of just how good Till Lindemann is as a vocalist. Overall, it is everything you'd expect from a Rammstein album. It is, it's not reinventing, reinventing the wheel in any way. And like I said before, it doesn't need to. They are consistently good. Like, I talked about Clutch, not Clutch, well, it's Clutch, fucking hell. Um, Grand Magus last week and then because of that Clutch, and uh, I'll kind of talk about a bit more in a bit with Amon Amarth. You've got bands like that which consistently do good albums. And you can always say, oh, this is probably like their weakest one or whatever. But outside like the early days, just consistently good. Rammstein, I don't think have a bum note in their entire back catalogue. Podcasts I was listening to, which reviewed this, were like, we've got nothing bad to say. It is, it is Rammstein. And everything we said for it, you could say for Libra Svalida, as much as you could say for Rosenrot or Sensuix, it's always going to be good because Rammstein are that brilliant. And if it is the last Rammstein album, which if I'm honest, I think it will be, I think they'll do this, get the tour out of the way. And yeah, I don't think it'll be the end permanently. I think in a few years' time, they'll maybe do a special like some special reunion shows or that sort of thing. But as a whole for releasing music consi- semi-consistently, I'd say 10-year gap, I do think this will be the last Rammstein album. For at least, like, I reckon they will copy the gap between Libus Ralada. I think this is their swan song. And I reckon it is a very respectable end. I think they've built a legacy. They are all, I think they're all in their 50s now, and they're still running around on stage setting fire to themselves with penises. So if that's not what you want to be when you grew up, then you're doing it wrong. I won't do it. Like, if you like Rammstein, well, if you like these bands, go for Rammstein. I feel like by now, if you don't know Rammstein, or if you haven't listened to Rammstein, how have you found me? Like, seriously. Um, go listen to Rammstein. They're fucking great. You're always going to have fun with them. And yeah, the Untitled album, it is brilliant. It is consistently good again. It's hard to pinpoint what's good and what's like isolated what's good purely because it's just a flat brilliant, you know? 
It's fine, Sean, yeah. Um, but no, that's their seventh, seventh album from the Berlin natives. I believe they're from Berlin. And yeah, do go check it out. It's a lot of fun. Auslander still is a damn riot. Right then, on to album number two for this week. And it's the third album from Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes, a band and a man I talk about probably a bit too much, both on the podcast and in real life. The album is called End of Suffering. Like I said, it's their third album. It's from the Watford-based band. And it's kind of difficult to say they are a this genre kind of band because two albums in for uh, the Rattlesnakes and they've gone two very different styles of music. They went from the hardcore, like straight up visceral hardcore from uh, Blossom. Modern Ruin had a more like dark indie rock vibe to it all with end of suffering i've kind of still got those like dark dirty indie rock vibes to it all with like the splash maybe of art rock i don't know i'm a bit on the fence about it all but let's get into it um with all these biopics being made around the world's like biggest frontmen, like you had um behemian rhapsody you just had rocket man there's a george michael one being made as we speak I would love to see something similar for Frank Carter. You know, he's the talismanic frontman of whatever he does. Excuse me. Um, Those early days of hardcore chaos to today's, like, on the face of it. And almost like musically, he is the rock and roll gentleman. At the same time, when he's performing live, he is that guy who's terrifying landlords as he hangs upside down from the sport beams of the venue. And he's very quickly becoming, whether it's tattoos, it's his vocal style, his live performances, his ginger hair. He is like one of the most recognizable and iconic musicians like on the rise at the moment. And... In like his age, I say that as if he's like he's is an old timer. I think he's just turned like thirty one. I think he's still painfully young in the grand scheme of things. Um, but the way he's like he's attacked music nowadays compared to when he first started Gallows back in the day. It, nowadays it's a bit more. It's a lot, but I say a bit more. It's a lot more sincere. Um, there's more meaning now than ever before. Because whereas before it was. You know, politics are always going to be something that musicians write about, and it's always going to be a bit of a sore subject, especially when they're, like, bang on the money. Um, Like, a lot of people, people better than I, will talk about how Great Britain's pretty much come true, you know. Um, But nowadays, it's a lot more impactful, and there's more meaning behind it, because it is so personal to Frank. Like, I said when the song Anxiety came out from this album, and it was, it's just all about him, no matter his successes and how much people praise him and like all the lords he get, he's still stuck in his own mind, which is not an easy thing to talk about, still stuck in his own mind about whether or not he is or is not good enough. And it's just, I remember hearing anxiety and just thought it's dark, but for like reasons that aren't usually what I consider dark music, because... It's a bit too real, if that makes sense. Um, And you go into, like, the opposite end of that scale. You've got the title track that finishes off the album. And it's all about his daughter and wanting to be the good father that he wants to be for his daughter. And I've seen, um, like, little videos and snippets on his social medias. And every time he's around her he is always smiling and like no matter what's going on in his head or his personal life he is always like the fountain of happiness for that little girl um and on songs like this like you got the lyric of i spent so many nights feeling i'm underqualified to be the father of a girl so strong and i feel like i'm only i only get it wrong like that not to go back to the previous song but the anxiety of it all it's just like i said it's just so much more personal and so much more um i guess it is a bit more relatable now we've all had our own doubts about whether or not we can do things and in a, like, a different kind of execution kitty sucker and like completely different ends of spectrum kitty sucker all about his love and relationship to um that 
I don't know, another, a partner of some kind. And yeah, it's, it's just all very... Um, it just sounds like what happens in Frank's head, which, for better or for worse, is both terrifying and very interesting. Um, there's still, quote-unquote, old Frank in there. I think Kitty Sucker will go down as the orchestra, orchestra of wolves for Gen Z kids. The lyrics get a little bit steamy. Just a, just a, just a tidbit. Uh, Tyrant Lizard King. Fucking great song. Um, he also does describe himself. His spirit animal is a T-Rex, which, you know, if you're going to have a spirit animal, go for something metal like a T-Rex. And in Crowbar, I think it is a great combination of Frank over the past, well, over his, over the years. Um, it's the mo- I think it's the most aggro song on the album, purely because I think out of any other song he does use, it's like shouty bark more than any other song that I can think of. Um, and yeah, it's like the most aggro song on the album whilst also possessing a lot of the new age indie blues, hard rock elements that he's been incorporating for the last, well, since Modern Ruin. Uh, and lesser point, or to a lesser extent, I should say, the Pure Love amp- uh, Pure Love album anthems. Um, when Crowbar first came out, I remember thinking that it felt a little bit more out there compared to Modern Ruin. But because of all the different experiments and all the different ideas being played around... Um, it's hard to tell whether or not Crowbar is therefore so outlandish it doesn't fit the overall mood of End of Suffering or if it's so outlandish it perfectly fits End of Suffering because there's just, there's so many different ideas and um, like Dean is a big responsibility of it. Like I don't want to gloss over him completely but he Dean Richardson is the guitarist and songwriter. He used to be in the band Heights all those years ago and overall he's done a fucking wonderful job um his guitar work in incorporated oh sorry his his guitar work has incorporated such a medley of sounds and genres and that kind of thing like going back to tyrant lizard king is like a fuzzy stoner rock kind of stomper crowbar and angel wings have him um, bouncing off um the drummer gareth's like almost like dance rock hi-hat beats and then why can't a, a why a spider? Yeah, fuck's sake! Why a butterfly can't love a spider? There's insects and there, arachnids in there somewhere. Um, the opening track, it's like a more brooding Nick Cave, dare I say, gothic kind of crawler. Um, and yeah, like it's no surprise that someone like me, who is like damn near everything Frank has put out over the past decade and a half, likes End of Suffering. You know, it is, I've had such a fun time listening to it. Um, like I said, Tyrant Lizard King. Took me a while to realise Tom Morello's in there, but when when you hear his name attached, then you go back to this guitar solo, you're like, fucking how have I not noticed it before? Um, Heartbreaker is this like really big, upbeat kind of track. And then like I said, the more emotional tracks like anxiety and end of suffering really do really do get you all up in there um i think the single biggest complaint i would have about end of suffering because like i said it's it's almost unfair i review this because i'm always going to like this sort of thing um the biggest complaint i'd have is why a butterfly can love a spider it's super on the nose um with about a subject to almost a, a cringe degree. I don't want to say it is all the way a bad song, but usually Frank in his lyrics is fairly metaphorical. And, you know, he'll, I can't think of an example now, but he'll think of like a way to get his point across without actually saying the words, or he will use, I don't know, like subjects around his core subjects. Like, so everyone knows what he's talking about, but he never has, as I say, this is it. Um, but on Butterfly, I feel like he's gone a bit too, like I said, a bit too on the nose. He is, it's very much like, this is this, this is this, this is this. And what's the lyric? Um, when I'm high, I'm in heaven. When I'm low, I'm in hell. Like, 
I feel like it should. I don't. I couldn't say who's done it or whatever, but I just feel like that's a lyric I've heard like a hundred times before. You know, it just might be. It's weird because anxiety is super on the nose as well. Like anxiety has no metaphors. It is straight up. What I was saying before, it's Frank laying it all on the table emotionally. But I don't feel the same way about anxiety. I felt anxiety was a more like like a, again. A very personal, very intimate kind of song, which I enjoyed. I don't know what it is. It's all a bit weird for me. But, you know, outside of Why Butterfly Can't Love a Spider, this album is a ton of fun. Um, Kitty Sucker, Heartbreaker, Crowbar, Tyrant Lizard King, uh, Angel Wings. It's all fucking brilliant. For this style of Frank Carter, like I said... um, Blossom was very different. Modern Room was a little bit different. Um, I'd go for, if you like Marmosets, if you like The Damn Things, I know I didn't give them a particularly glowing review a couple of weeks ago, but still, if you went in on that or the first album, go for this. Also, I'd say New End, New Age, sorry, uh, Queens of the Stone Age. That very modern, alternative, commercial sounding, um, like stonery rock. But just, it's, it's mature. It's all. It's romantic rock, which I think I still said it with um, Radke a while back. But I think everyone gets what I mean when I say like a modern Queens of the Stone Age sound as opposed to a classic, um, like rated R sort of thing. But yeah, Queens of the Stone Age, the damn things, and Mama Sets. If you go for any of them, do give Frank Carter and Rattlesnakes a, a go. Um, modern Ruin and Blossom. They, they are the this is a, a three different core sounds of an album so for any of those go for end of suffering and then work your way backwards and then get to blossom and have your face ticked in shit the bed man i need to leave for work so soon uh third album for this week it is album number 11 that is staggering numbers compared to what you usually do album number 11 from amona marth the pumba amazing swedish natives um, it is album number again, album number 11, just to reiterate that point, from the Viking-themed melodic death metal band. It's their first album to feature drummer... Hmm... Yoki? Jok? Go with Jok, because it's Scottish and therefore better. Uh, Jok Walgren, who has previously drummed for, played with, uh, Octobertide and Valkyria. And similar to... Ramstein, although I've gone into Ramstein a bit more, this is the first on Modern Math album that I like probably got in. That's the first one for me. Um, as opposed to Ramstein, though, a Modern Math are consistently releasing music, um, but with each album that's come, it I just it, it each album just comes and goes, you know. Um, I've been told to listen to Twilight of the Thunder Guards, and that is on my to listen list, so hopefully one day I get it on the open mic portion of the show. But yeah, I don't know what it is. I just. I just let a mono moth flutter by me, which is weird because it's all Viking y. It's melod- melodic death metal, classic melodic death metal, which I'll touch on in a bit. But I don't know. So this is. An isolated review, um, and from what I've seen so far, it's got a bit of a mixed bag from uh, the core Amon Amar fan base. So you've got some people comparing it to like the best album since Twilight of the Thunder Guard, best album of their modern era. At the same time, you've got people saying like it's a 3 out of 10, it's boring, it's dull, yada, yada, yada. Um, the first thing and the biggest thing that I notice as the is that this is melodic death metal with actual choruses. And it sounds a bit weird, but every time I've tried looking for melodic death metal recently, they lack what I feel is a core characteristic of the genre, and that is the big melodic choruses. Um, And the thing that makes a melodic death metal chorus so good is they are still backed by all the melodic death composition in the background, but just the... That huge bit of actual melody in the chorus where you've got the vocalist just like sore with his vocal range or her vocal range. They just always sound fucking brilliant. Um, And 
yeah, I hear a lot of bands these days just keep going for like the very brutal attack all the way through the chorus. I'm like, this is cool and all, but I just want some big notes with a gravelly tone to it, you know? And it might just be a me thing. It probably is just a me thing. It's a weird thing to complain about, but here we are. Um, but those choruses are straight away evident in Fafna, Fafnar's Gold. Um, like an Iron Maiden on cocaine guitar harmony over top of those thunderous um, double kick bass lines. And yeah, it's, straight away I've got exactly what I want from melodic death metal. Um, across the entire album, I think Johan's vocals are that rare brand of death metal vocal whereby I play it with a little bit of concentration. You can make out the lyrics. And like, for me, I kept just getting like little lyrical hooks here and there to the more seasoned death metal connoisseur. This would probably be like reading the Bible to you. Um, but for me, even myself, I can, make, I can make out his accent, which is really, really cool. I don't know why, but I always like hearing... Um, the accents in music, I think it gives it a bit more personality and makes it a bit more unique. Um, and overall, I know it sounds dumb to say like, ah, you can understand the lyrics in this death metal band. But because like being able to understand lyrics means that the vocalist is using range. It's not just, you know, a fart coming through a radio. He's got, he can hit the inflections and the right emphasis and the right letters for words. And you can pick out more what he's saying and like it adds to the melody of the song if that makes sense um and as much as i enjoyed it there's been times where it's very hit or miss on the lyrics themselves like for every you know it's like you get good lyrics like with malice and deceit he got them to agree to the, to create nine magic gifts for the azar gods or you've got glistening veils of silver snow on our sleeping ships dark skies fill our souls with silent screams that's a lot of fucking S's. Um, so you've got really cool, dramatic, like, um, Norse-inspired lyrics like that. At the same time, you've got a chain is never stronger than its weakest link. Or there is a darkness in my soul, a darkness that can't be tamed. Like, if you want to rip off Miley Sari, please just don't. That's all I ask. Um... And I get that it, it must be difficult to conjure up lyrics based on uh, stories already been told or whilst retelling those stories. But over, I feel like a better job could have been done. That's just as someone who's never had to write a lyric before. Um, one of the things that did catch me off guard regarding lyrics is, or like the vocals I should say, is there are times in the album, and I don't, don't know if this is a new thing or if this is something that Johan's been doing throughout the entire Amon Amoth uh, reign, is he has little bits of clean vocals here and there. And like I said, I don't know if that's a normal thing. I've never really noticed it before, but then, like I said before, I haven't really gone in them massively. Um, I feel like he's trying to go for a deep, foreboding, like Christopher Lee style thing, but I don't really think he hits it. Which, it's hard to knock it because like, they've made the attempt to try and add something new to their repertoire. And, you know, that's commendable. But I think trying to emulate like a Christopher Lee style thing, it just can't be done because Christopher Lee's voice is just A, too iconic and B, just too natural, I think. I think that was just his general speaking voice. I think on the lines of, and if you haven't heard um, Christopher Lee in a metal environment, He's got two, I think, two solo albums, uh, Charlemagne and something. And he also did a lot of voice work with Rhapsody of Fire in the 2000s. Great job on there. Unholy Warcry. Still mega. Um, but it's got a similar sort of thing to Lemmy, where everyone wants to have the Lemmy vocal. And Lemmy was always like, this is, I had a problem with my throat, and this is what I sound like now. Um, I think he compared it to, like, uh, Ape once. I think I read an interview, something like that. An ape with his head in the bin. Uh, musically, I can't fault it. Um, really like the almost like power thrash chorus to Skull and Hattie, or Skull and Haiti, um, and on Wings of Eagles. It is consistent, like Iron Maiden worshipping harmonies with those big fist pumping riffs in the rhythms. The bass tone, I love death metal bass because it just sounds like a hammer 
on an anvil every single time. I fucking adore it. It sounds so cool. Um, the new guy, Yok, Jock, sorry. Um, I'll probably still get his name wrong. Um, new guy, Jock. Fuck. The new drummer blends real cool, like, little fills and little rolls with, like, war drum, uh, kind of like tom beats as well. And it fits the whole Amon Amoth Viking aesthetic so, so good. If this were a new band, I'd say I couldn't wait for the next album. There's a lot of good moments. And a couple of songs which are consistently good throughout. By no means is this a bad album, but I think I do agree with some of the critics where it does get a little bit samey after a certain while. And as I've gone on before, lyrics can be a little bit awkward. I'd say, I know it's 12 songs long, but it's just shy of an hour. I'd maybe take a song or two out just to get down to... um, 50 minutes like 50 to 45 i think that'll make it a little bit better because you have got like this it's a nice lump of melodic death mode instead of like a full hour but again might just be me i don't go for melodic death quite as often as i'd like so you know it's just down to personal preference um but it sounds like though like i said if i'd have all those comments if this were a new band because this is an album this is a band are they 20 years in as well let's have a ganders Dum, 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 1992. So yeah, just shy. Of, fuck, just shy. Of Thirty years. Hot darn. I uh, said so just shy. Of Thirty odd years. Um, because they've been going on for that long. And by the fact that I've read that they like the last. I don't think it was Yon's Viking. Was it the one just before? Deceiver of the Gods. I think it was Deceiver of the Gods and Surto Rising. That top charts, didn't it? Like, they've had some chart-topping albums, and based on that history, and based on everything I've heard of Amon Amarth, they are so renownedly loved by the metal community. I've got, like, a treasure trove of a back catalogue to go through. And, um, yeah, like I said, top of that list is Twilight of the Thunder God, so hopefully one day I'll get around to that by the end of the year. Hopefully, maybe, probably not. Um, at the same time as that, I don't want this to mean that Amon Amarth are on a downward trajectory. Um, again, they, this is a perfect serviceable album, and I think it might be a case of a monomath experts will talk about if it's their least good or not. But as I was saying with um, Ramstein earlier, it is a clutch Grand Mega Syndrome kind of effect where a monomath don't really have a bad album for as far as I'm aware. It is just their least good, you know. But again. Not an expert, could be completely wrong. If you are, if you consider yourself an expert or like a big fan of Modern Math, please do get in touch and let me know what you think. Um, and like I said, yeah, they're well revered across the metal spectrum as far as I can tell. And I wouldn't want them to go all Undertaker on us and keep playing when they are shit. And for the wrestling fans out there who watch Super, Soldier, Super, yeah, Super Showdown, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Again, I won't do a For Fans Off thing because 11 albums in, I feel like by now, the core fan base is there. Any new guys will know what you can tell from looking at them. They they don't play indie rock. Um, they are a big, massive, viking theme melodic death metal band. The album is called Berserker. It is album staggeringly number 11 from the Swedish natives Amon Amarth. Right then, those are the three albums for this week. Let's hopefully, oh, let's see if we can get through it all. Um, the out uh, album, <laughs> yes, words. The open mic we'll go with is an album from all the way back in the glorious year of 2001. It wasn't that glorious, lots of bad shit happened. Um, the album is called Jane Doe, it is by the hardcore menace that is Converge. Uh, they are from Salem in Massachusetts. This was album number four for them, and if you aren't already aware of Converge, they are a massive foreboding very technical hardcore act which sounds like putting your head in the engine of a jet engine jet plane sorry they're really really big and scary is what i'm trying to say this was their first album with nate newton on bass having previously played for jesuit and old man gloom and also with drummer ben collar who have previously played for ford Fe force fed glass uh, Jane Doe marked the start of the exponential exponential rise for the star of Converge. That banana earlier is really repeating on me, and I apologise. 
Uh, it is rightly heralded, or was rightly heralded, I should say, upon its release as like a like a critical acclaim. It was a fantastic album. And from there, it quickly became a cult classic. And from there again, it has become a regular fixture on best of all time lists. Everything about the album is iconic, even down to the album artwork, which is everywhere. You got it's on tattoos. It's on like it's still now a key part of Converge's art. Um, back patches. It's it's just awesome tattoos. If I haven't already mentioned that, it's it's so cool. It's so neat. And she is staring at me, so I'm going to move on. Um. And overall, when you consider all that, it is remarkable that it is, like, best of all time. I think, I can't remember who it is, but he's regularly cited as, like, a thousand album you should hear before you die. And this is, like, qu very high up there. It's in, like, Rolling Stones, best of all time lists. Um, all that is insane when you consider the kind of music this is. And the first listen of Jane Doe is so difficult. It is a fast, abrasive mess of sounds headlined by some, quite frankly, horrific sounds that are you will come to learn is just the vocal style of frontman Jacob Bannon. The opening track of Concubine rings out more like you're just stuck in the trenches of um, World War One. Like It's a barrage of like artillery-like drums with those shrieks of terror from Jacob just all over the top of it. It just... And at no point does it relent, even like the slower, sludgy songs like Hell to Pay or the 11 minute title track ending song. Though they lack like the blistering pace and speed of the rest of the album, they still possess such a foreboding and sinister kind of terror. And when you get a commercial, a commercial music listener, um, or like a someone who listens to hip-hop when you get someone like that who comes over to you and like brands alternative music as music you can't understand can't understand what they're saying this is the sort of thing that would be a really good evidence in their argument like i have no idea what jacob's saying throughout the entire album at one point i had the lyrics to broken view but broken view broken vow in front of me whilst listening to the songs and i could not like line the lyrics up at all uh, admittedly i didn't have headphones but you know it's right there, and I've still struggled. I still... It took me a long old time to try and go, Oh, they sing that word. Oh. Um, and even, like, the clean bits like on that Jane Doe uh, ender. The clean bits on that, I have no fucking idea. The soaring vocal lines that Jacob does, it's just... Pfft, a pfft, a pfft. It is... Initially, I found it so incredibly difficult... That it was meant to be the open mic for last week, but I just felt like A, I needed, and B, this deserved just that extra week. Just that little bit more time to really wrap my head around it. Um, but, and there's a big but, Greg Wooden of redbrick.me, uh, he did his own like uh, review from about two years ago, I think it was. And there's a line at the end of his review, or partway through his review, I should say, which really sums Jane Doe by Converge just perfectly. Um, Deference to classical music theory is generally avoided in favour of pure, unbridled catharsis. I think that's such a great line and such a great and apt description for Jane Doe because that's what this is. This is catharsis. It is the emotional release you need where you can fantasize about that asshole com customer getting hit by a car or you can imagine your ex falling into a wasp nest. You can take all that energy stored up of things just being shit. Like everything shit right now. It hasn't stopped raining for two days. You've got Trump, you've got uh, Theresa May, you've got Brexit, you've got Syria, you've got everything, all that. That's just like on the grand scale, just for you, your own personal problems, all that venom and rage you build up. You can just take it, listen to Jane Doe, and put all that power into running headfirst into a fucking wall and hoping that it just it comes down all around you. That's what I like to do in my spare time. It is just so intense. Um, it is a cacophony of riffs ranging from like the power chord barrage of a hardcore punk song to like the more te technical intricacies of mathcore to those planet-sized slabs of sludge metal here and there 
Um, my favourite part of the music, my favourite part about the entire album is every single part of it. Every single note, drum hit, vocal hook, it is all carefully crafted, you know? Like, for music like this, it's so hard to think of how you would write that kind of music. But you just know, like, considering, um, like, Kurt Blue, the guitarist, has become, like, such a renowned producer. Um, Jacob Bannon, we've seen in his Where Your Wounds side project, he's become a really, really good songwriter as well. And just the talent of everyone else as part of the band, um, Nate Ben at the time, Aaron. You know that if someone played a line at like it didn't quite fit they would be able to figure out why it didn't fit and how to change it if it was like dropping down tuning or moving up the neck or just getting a completely different line you know exactly that they would be able to pinpoint the problem and fix it there and then um and that's just like like i said before you can never understand the lyrics but when you look them up and i do advise you if you go in and look for jane doe definitely look up the lyrics because for instance i've got Two songs here, they're relatively short um, for lyrics, but Broken Vow, the song I was trying to pinpoint for ages. Those nights we had and the trust we lost, then sleep that fled me and the heart I lost. It all reminds me just how callous and heartless the true cowards are. And I write this for the loveless and the risks we take. I'll take my love to the grave. As tired as tired as war, yeah. as tired and worn it is, I'll take my love to the grave. Fuck. It's so good. It's It's not overly campy or like doe-eyed or something it's cynical but it's um big and expansive at the same time it's modern day poetry on fault and fracture like these like you listen to these songs they are not soppy like doe-eyed harry styles bollocks this is intense hardcore um in fault and fracture you were most beautiful as the damage and the trauma pounding hard with the battered wings of destiny you were my last great war you were my heaven ablaze riddle with faults and fractures and i spent my last my last of days burning my oldest of bridges and i spent my last of nights killing the best of friends in the company of thieves liars begs and whores i'll lay waiting just waiting for my time to come it is haunting yet so powerful and so beautiful that words like that can be associated with music this devastating like, this is what they should be teaching at schools for, like, GCSE English. None of that, like, dreary Shakespeare bollocks. This is, like, high-end uh, poetry. And, you know, like, musical writing. It's just fucking insane. I can't think of another album that goes this hard and this heavy while still being this delicate lyrically. For every sombre pop ballad... Every country hoedown and every, like, emo, false flag, crowd starter, none of them take you off your feet from the sheer brutality in the same way that Converge does or that Jane Doe does. This is, this is not an album for the faint hearted. Like I said, excuse me, as someone who has been listening to, like, the difficult end of music for a long old time now, I really struggled with this at first. You do need to give it repetitive listens um and i think even now i'm gonna like keep it on my phone to like just keep going back to it and take more and more in at a time and you know like get the lyrics for it and just read it all from back to front because the lyrics are just incredible um you need you need to give it time so you can fully digest it and yeah just if you do go for it, this is the first time you've ever heard of converge or first time you've ever heard of Jindo, you've always wanted to go in on converge Give this a go and let me know how your experience has been. If it's been a case of you hated it to, oh my god, like, it, not for me, I didn't hate it at first, but you struggled with it and it got better, or you just like a flat, I couldn't get into it, or whatever, please talk to me. I need to talk to someone. Um, as a whole, Jane Doe marked the last album with Converge as a five piece. Um, guitarist Aaron Dolbeck left the same year to so give his full time attention to his Bane side project. Um, since then, he's also been an active member of the metallic hardcore group Only Crime, which also features Bill Stevenson from The Descendants, um, and at one time, Zach Blair from Rise Against, before he was part of Rise Against. As for the rest of Converge, 
converge quite happily. I don't usually get to say this on open mic. They're all still together and still all the best of friends all having a very good time. Touch wood. Um, Jacob Bauer, the vocalist, he's got his Wear Your Wounds post-metal side project. He was also in a short-lived project called Irons, which had uh, Dwid Hellion from Integrity and Stephen Kasner, who is an illustrator. Bannon himself, an illustrator, also designs artwork, having worked with the likes of Every Time I Die, Trap Them, Sepultura, Cave In, and Disfear, plus so many more. Go away, phone. Um, Kurt Blue, the guitarist, he's musically worked with the likes of Trap Them, Genghis Strong, Torch, Old Man Gloom, and more. But now, outside of Converge, he is known as one of the finest and best musical producers this like alternative world has seen. He's got his own studios called God City Studios in Massachusetts. He's worked with Darkest Hour, Nails, Oathbreaker, Code Orange, Agrophobic Nosebleed. If you want, if you're in a hardcore band, you want your music to be touched or produced or just breathed on by a Kurt Ballou. He is that high. He is that good. He's just fucking amazing. He is like, um, like the modern day Oprah seal of approval for books. Oprah's got books. Kurt Bellow's got hardcore. Um, Nate Newton, bassist, he is continuing with his Old Man Gloom side project. Um, he's also the front man of another Doom band called Doom Riders. And very, very briefly for the... Is it Pandemic album? No, Pandemonium. He joined Cavalier, Cavalier Conspiracy for the Pandemonium album before, I think, just leaving, go, like, focusing back onto Converge and Doom Riders. And lastly, but ever so, definitely not lastly. No, no, wait. Lastly, ignore all that. Uh, we've got the drum up Ben Collar. He is, he go on his, his social media, so his Facebook or his Instagram, and you usually have a bunch of really, really fun drum cams from live shows of Converge. They are just scintillating. And the noise he can make with the drums, I've seen some of these. He's got a very small kit in the grand scheme of things. It's pretty mad. Um, since then, he's also worked with, or since Jane Doe, he has worked with Supergroup United Nations, um, All Pigs Must Die, he's a Mutoid Man, and he's also recently become the drummer of the Supergroup Killer Be Killed, which also features Greg, formerly of Dinger Escape Plan, um, Max Cavalera from Soulfly, uh, Troy Sanders from Mastodon, I think that's it, that's a three-piece, he replaced uh, Dave Eilick, I think his name is, from the Mars Volta. And yeah, Killer Be Killed, fucking great album and a great project. So I'm really excited for album two, of which all of them have said they are totally down to make. So fingers crossed. And that, oh, I'm so late for work. That will do it for this week. Please bet that be all for this week. Um, I have blitzed through a lot of the reviews. So if there's anything you want a little bit more extra insight on, please, please do let me know. But this week we have looked at Rammstein, Frank Carbon, Rattlesnakes, and Monomath, and the legendary Jane Doe by Converge. Next week, oh, it's still getting good. We've got Employed to Serve, we've got the Wild Hearts, and we've got the Skints to review, plus hopefully some actual news that's going to happen between here and then. Like I said, anything else you want to know, do get in touch. Everything is always at Desolation Pod. But until such time, have a great week, and I will see you soon. Hopefully it will stop raining, but probably not. Bye-bye. <laughs>